Thank you very much. Thank you to all the uh, organizers of the festival, a really extraordinary event. And I'm hoping, uh, actually, I'm quite sure that this panel is going to contribute uh, very much to the quality of the festival as well. Um, so uh, I'm just going to give a few moments of introduction and then really kind of bring the panel into play. Um, and at some point, I'm going to try and uh, offer uh, comments uh, to uh, people in the audience. Either you're going to use the app or we'll also have a rolling mic if people would rather use that. So much of the last two days, thankfully, we have heard a lot about financial inclusion. Um, and I think over the last three or four years, the topic of financial inclusion has moved from a very marginal discussion within the sort of broader fintech community to, to really quite a significant piece, not only of the general narrative, but of a growing number of business models, as we can see throughout the halls and throughout the sessions here today. But financial inclusion is only one piece of the story. Um, when we think about the Sustainable Development Goals, when we think about the Paris Agreement on Climate, uh, we begin to link it to the kind of financing requirements of which financial inclusion may be one part, but is by no means the whole. Estimates by the United Nations and also uh, other uh, research organizations put numbers of five to seven trillion dollars, US dollars a year, as the price tag for securing the Sustainable Development Goals and the Climate Agreement Goals by 2030 and beyond. These are obviously huge numbers, partly linked to the very people that we have been talking about over the last couple of days, those that are unbanked, those that can access new sources of lending, but also into the capital market side. Uh, the huge amount of money that is required to finance infrastructure across every country, less developed, developing, emerging, and developed. Um, and beyond the sort of the crude numbers that are needed to put infrastructure on the ground or to make financial services available to many people, it is the issue of quality. Uh, if, if you'd been in the uh, uh, speaker's lounge before uh, we came up, you would have witnessed not quite a fight between the panelists, but certainly a very feisty argument about whether financial inclusion is the end of the story or, or whether then one has to figure out what kind of development benefits that actually delivers. And I'm hoping we'll bring that out in the discussion today. Similarly, in the infrastructure side, um, it's not just about building buildings, building bridges, building railways, and so on. You know, we need to begin to shape infrastructure in a way that is less harmful to the environment, you know, helps to manage climate change challenges, uh, and indeed provides public service access, which isn't necessarily covered by the financial inclusion agenda. That is the subject of this panel, ladies and gentlemen. Moving beyond the basic financial inclusion story, which is a cause for celebration, and beginning to look at that bigger financing agenda and where fintech really fits into that. And we have really a perfect panel to help us kick off that discussion and then I'm going to come to you in the audience for your perspectives and questions. Um, Greta, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Um, you have, dare I say it, a, a rare combination of an international perspective and also a very granulated perspective in your work. H help us understand broadly where you see the fintech conversation in the room relating to that broader financing agenda. Thanks very much. Um, and I think the words were robust discussion, not fierce argument. But, uh, that's uh, what I meant. Right. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I think we've seen a real revolution in the last um, six years in, in digital financial services and fintech. Um, and that has been driven by connectivity and that's been driven by payments. Um, and we're now seeing the emergence of platforms that connect um, the ability to make payments with the need for services. Um, and so we've done a lot of work at CGAP on understanding what, how payments can facilitate a lot of the other development goals, particularly at the retail level. 
Um, so we see lots of different business models emerging um, around the world. Um, some of them are sort of, you know, come out of the microfinance world. We see asset financing business models that enable off-grid electric to thrive. We see a very large off-grid industry emerging in um, sub-Saharan Africa. It's spreading to other parts of the world, being driven by different payments factors. But that off-grid um, set of insights has led to new business models enabling irrigation models that are also enabled by micropayments. Um, Tractors, shared the sharing economy, shared resources that help on the agricultural side. We also see water um, as water and sanitation as areas that finance can enable. And sometimes that's micropayments, sometimes it's credit, sometimes it's a combination of the two. But um, a lot of interesting business models emerging. Um, on the poverty side, of course, and, and we have talked about it a lot, so just briefly to give it note, you know, we see a lot of interesting G2P payments happening that, that um, I think have an impact on empowering people and, and, and alleviating some of the, the symptoms of poverty, at least, and, the, and digital credit products that are starting to get cash management products into people's hands. Um, we're also seeing um, off of the back of some of the asset financing models, in particular, the ability to collateralize that asset and use it for other purposes. So we've seen education loans, for example, coming out of um, solar home systems. Um, and so there are a lot of different kind of creative applications coming out. Um, E-commerce, I think, opens up a huge amount of interesting opportunities for people to be able to create livelihoods for themselves, to be able to sell and buy products online and connect with the global economy through the platforms and through the payments capabilities that they provide. And we're also seeing a lot of really interesting innovations in the insurance space. So um, agri-insurance, um, which relates to the climate topic that you were talking about. So helping people to weather shocks. Index insurance is something that we've seen a lot of. We're seeing a lot of mobilization around disaster risk finance um, that helps on the mitigation side of climate change. Um, we're seeing health insurance models emerge on the back of, of some of the payments infrastructure. And we're seeing you know accident and other kind of livelihood insurance products products emerge. So, and, and that's really being driven by data trails that are possible because of these platforms that are connected and because of the payments infrastructure that they generate. So we're very optimistic at the retail level that we're seeing a lot of innovation that will actually serve the development goals. And I think to your point about impact, it's important for us as the financial inclusion community to recognize that actually nobody ever woke up and thought, I really wish I had insurance. It's for a purpose. You need, people want to educate their kids. They want to be healthy. They want to protect themselves against downside risk. And finance enables that. It's, it's a means to an end, not an end in itself. Brilliant. Thanks. That's a great opening. Piyush, I'd like to turn to you. At a certain moment, uh, probably oh, a couple of years ago now, you said to me, um, you know, part of my future strategy is looking at the intersection of sustainability and digital. Um, in relation to DBS Bank. I, I'd love to get your sense as to kind of where that conversation is going in terms of DBS, but also more broadly in terms of the banking community in the region. Thanks, thanks, Simon. Um, I think at the big level, uh, the big challenge for all of us uh, as uh, you know, society, civilization, uh, is this challenge of you know financing the 17 SDGs or financing development as a whole? You got a big number there, seven trillion. I sometimes wonder who came up with the number. I've read the number a lot, but it could be four, five, seven. It's a big number. A large part of that is classic infrastructure, and the reality is there's a big gap even in classic infrastructure finance, leave alone sustainable finance. And so in Asia, there's like again another number, 1.7 trillion required every year. There's about 800 billion available every year. Uh, the real challenge is that uh, the money is there. There are large pools of savings, some 75 trillion in the world. A lot of that is in the West. Uh, it's very hard to find quote unquote bankable projects even in infrastructure. Now, when you move beyond classic infrastructure to what I call the SDG goals, to eliminate poverty, eliminate hunger, clean water, sanitation, uh, how do you create enough bankable opportunities in that is very hard. The root of the problem is quite simple. And everybody knows that. The root of the problem is that the market economy that we live in, Adam Smith's you know, self-interest competition supply demand, uh, actually ignores a very important ingredient of value, and that is a social capital. Social capital or natural capital, or what today is increasingly called externalities. So 
many of these projects and development agendas of sustainability would make sense if you could actually rope in and count in the externalities, both positive externalities and, and negative externalities. Because you can't do that, you set up a factory, but there's pollution. Or on the other hand, you wind up creating uh, employment for you know, women at the margin. The positive impacts of that don't get counted. Since the externalities don't get counted, it's really hard to make these projects bankable. So to really change this thing, we've got to be able to figure a world in which people start accounting for p and and accounting for value in a very different way, including the externalities. Now, what does that take? It takes two things. One, it takes intent. So it takes intent because larger and larger numbers of people, companies, citizens, etc., have got to start saying there is a cost or price for externalities or a value for externalities. We need to count that. I think that dialogue is beginning to change, albeit very, very slowly. At the margin, my investors are beginning to say, hey, we need to know what you are investing in and what returns you will create on a sustainable basis. My customers and my employees are beginning to ask that question, but it is uh, uh, marginal. Interestingly, big business is beginning to ask the question. So the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, which DBS is a member of, uh, we have six wings. One of our big work uh, themes is really what is value and how do you define value differently. But even assuming you get over that hurdle, people start worrying about it. There's another big set of problems, and that really is around, it's really hard to measure, it's really hard to track, and it's really hard to price. How do you price it? Now, this is where I think digital finance really has the capacity to be a game changer. First, I think AI and machine learning for the first time, the available of big data, allows you to start measuring what I call the butterfly impact. So, you know, something happens some way, what impact does it have on society as a whole? What impact does it have on economies? You couldn't do that before. But today, big data, machine learning, AI means the computer is so smart, you can start getting your hands around a measurement at some uh, uh, level. Uh, you can start tracking it a lot better. Uh, so for example, provenance tracking and sustainability tracking of goods, we at DBS are just launching a rubber exchange so that working with some startups who do geospatial tracking, we can track down to the farmer whether the rubber is sustainable or not. Last week, we announced a blockchain-based agri-commodities platform where again, you can do the same thing. You can track from the farmer all the way to the factory gate. Now, this ability to start tracking is, again, unique, which means that you can now start thinking of a financing model which can price for uh, what is the sustainability of the things that you're getting, and on the other hand, people are willing to pay for it. So I think digital finance can change the way you track. We can also do that, by the way, in the consumer space. You know, uh, Ant started this, being able to create a carbon scorecard for people. We at DBS are beginning to copy it, and saying, based on your spending patterns, I know what you spend on your credit card, debit card, etc. I can give you a carbon scorecard. And once I start tracking it and measuring it, then you as an individual can start saying, hey, do I want to do something about this? But the third thing that digital finance can do, apart from measuring and tracking, is you can start pricing. So once you have a carbon tax, Singapore is going to have a $5 tax starting next year, Canada starting a $10 tax per ton for carbon. Now you can create a market for pollution. You can create a market for pricing. Uh, Singapore Power just recently announced uh, exchange for RECs, renewable exchange certificates, electricity certificates. DBS was one of the first people on the marketplace because we're committed to having 100% renewable electricity in our consumption by 2030. Digital finance lets you create these exchanges and marketplaces to price and trade for these externalities. I think this ability to measure, to track, and price and trade will allow digital finance to start being able to shed a light on what is the true PNL value to society of projects. And hopefully, I can't say for sure, Hopefully, the stars bringing in some of this private capital into the equation when you can start doing this thing better. Piyush, that's fantastic. And maybe on the second round, you know, I can ask the question to you and others, because you've implied it, maybe there's a role for public policy or regulation to valorize what's being measured, that that isn't something that the market automatically delivers. Maybe that's something to come back to. Chuchurita, maybe I can come on to you now. You're experience spans capital markets, banking, and other aspects of finance. So it would be fantastic to hear a little from you as to kind of where you see the broad trends and opportunity in the nexus between sustainability and financing and fintech. Yeah, so um, 
I, I, I do think that, you know, coming back to sustainability, and I think that the sustainable development goals are a, you know, remarkably elegant framework, but how do we look at it from the point of view of uh, every household? If you look at the micro view of uh, the sustainable development goals, they are about ending poverty, ending hunger, decent work, um, uh, you know, lowering inequality, empowering women. And if you think about it, even the way these are worded, uh, ending hunger means that you need to do this for every single household. Only then you achieve the sustainable development goals. And uh, I, I think that the way, uh, you know, digital finance is going to change, um, uh, you know, change impact is that we're going to move from financial inclusion which is counting the number of bank accounts that have been opened to financial wellness or uh, financial impact uh, on the customer, which is actually measuring, uh, you know, did you send your daughter to college or not? Did you eat, was your family able to eat, how, how, you know, the amount of calories and vitamins and minerals they were supposed to eat or not, because these are the real outcomes that really matter for these customers. So now, how, how do we get there? Um, we can get there by, uh, because you know, at the end of the day, financial products are complex, right? These, uh, apart from perhaps savings bank accounts, financial products are very complex. How are customers supposed to know how to combine all these different financial products to actually meet their life's goals? because the sustainable development goals are really each household's life goals. And I think digital finance today with the amount of data that's available, um, even for marginalized customers. So for example, in India, we now have, um, you know, Highmark, which is one of the credit bureaus, uh, which has, uh, you know, something like over 300 million records. Um, uh, you know, of credit bureaus. These are not for unique customers. They probably represent 40, 45 million customers' credit footprint over the last decade or so. Uh, so we have pretty good credit bureau records. We have transaction history. Um, we have, uh, you know, savings patterns. We don't yet have social network data because they're not on social networks yet. Uh, and we know where these, we, we can ask the customers the questions around what do you want to achieve in life? And it's possible using artificial intelligence, machine learning, to actually give them the right advice and to say that, you know what, this is your microfinancial plan. Um, and this is the combination of regular savings, investments, a credit card, insurance that you should take to actually send your daughter to college. Because then we would have met the sustainable development goal for that one person. And if we do this for many, many such people, we would have actually achieved it. So I do think that, you know, what do we need? One is, I think we, every customer needs good financial advice. We need much better products, much better products uh, for the customers to get there. So today, for example, if you look at formal financial channels, uh, we are failing this customer. We have uh, customers who have had credit bureau history for the last decade and who are either saying that, you know what, the market is saying to them, I will either give you a loan of $1,000 or I will give you nothing at all. You and I get $2 on credit, right, through our credit card. They don't have access to that. Of course, you need small amounts of credit uh, which you can repay frequently, but this market is extremely nascent and we need many more organizations uh, doing this. So I'll point to a couple of organizations that are actually doing this. The third and final thing that we need is good delivery, good execution at the lowest possible cost. And again, tech, mobile phones, uh, really make that possible in a new way. And so to just a small follow-up question, then Jojo, I'll come across to you, which is, okay, so from financial inclusion to dot, 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 well-being, some, something well-being, that there may be many people in the audience, maybe not, who go, yes, that's the right outcome, but we're the financial sector, that's not our job. You know, so, you know, our limit is, you know, we can provide financial services, 
then the government or other businesses need to figure out how to give advice on good education, say. Do, w would you call that out as misunderstanding the next generation of business models, or would you go along with that? No, I think that the, you know, there will be some very profitable companies that come up that really do good wealth management and financial planning and financial advice for these customers. After all, uh, these are the largest number of customers in the world today. So I, uh, I don't think this is the job of the government at all. Uh, this is about, uh, you know, you probably have a wealth manager, um, uh, you know, who's advising you. Uh, some people in this room do, <laughs> at any rate. Uh, but what we need is to offer that service at a price point through technology, through the use of analytics, that's affordable. Uh, and that's possible. And the second point I'd like to make, you know, connecting back to uh, Piyush's point around capital markets, is that now we, you know, we have a few companies right, uh, that are doing this. We just need hundreds more of them. We need capital markets to be financing m many more of these companies and to be evaluating these companies on the basis of not just financial returns, but the societal returns that are being generated until we fix that capital markets problem, I, I don't think we will see the hundreds more companies right. that are there. There are too few of them around. And so to strengthen the connection between Piyush and your point, actually some of those externalities that you're talking about, Piyush, need to be valorized into advisory models you know, that can actually enhance the usefulness of finance that's being leveraged. So you know, that's a sort of a, a, at least at the retail level, one of the connections that can be made. Thank you, Sujadita, indeed. Jojo, let me come on to you. Uh, also very much focused on the financial inclusion side, so I'm keen to hear partly where you fit into this conversation about financial inclusion to well-being, um, but, but I'm also keen to get your broader take on where, where FinTech plays through to that broader financing agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Um, for a while, I thought that you know, when I took this job with Wing, I thought that uh, financial inclusion was already complex because my job there was to find a way by which uh, while executing our programs uh, to, to pursue financial inclusion, what is the impact on the people that we serve, right? So financing the SDGs is even a lot more complex, right? So, uh, and I'll take it from a, uh, an anecdote that I had. When we were trying to um, convert people uh, from cash to cashless, we went to a, a remote uh, village and said that, you know, um, what will it take for us to, you know, give you wallets uh, so that you can be converted from cash to cashless? And they said, you know, we're already cashless. We don't have cash, right? So, um, and so, so, so what do we do, right? So, so, you know, that anecdote simply tells us that there's more to all of these concepts. So, when we talk about fintech, when we talk about uh, coming up with a, let's say, an insure tech, you know, wherein you allow, uh, you allow insurance to be brought down, brought down to, the, to the base of the pyramid, and we succeed, and then something happens to the insured, and there's no hospital in the area, it doesn't solve the problem. The impact is still the same, you know. Uh, you did not improve their well-being because uh, there was no hospital. Or uh, let's say, uh, you know, we, we, we try to partner with MFIs uh, so that uh, they'll be able to move money from each other, so that they'll be able to expand uh, their ability to give loans to more people. And then you use blockchain to, to facilitate, you know, uh, efficient transfer of money but they don't have the right core banking solutions yet to, to basically accommodate this technology. So, um, again, it's, it's, it's very complex, but, uh, and I agree that at the end of the day, you know, we will all be measured on the impact that we've had in getting people who do not have jobs not to be hungry, right? Or people who do not have cash, um, uh, to be not poor, right? So it, 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 it combines a lot uh, of uh, thinking. So um, my appreciation of, of this is very complex and probably don't have the solution is that the onset of new fintech, the fintech, all of these ideas, great ideas uh, are very good, but I think we have to, 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 to revisit, um, uh, you know, when we, talk, when we start talking about capital markets, when we start talking about availability of money, 
to fund this new fintech. Maybe we have to fo refocus it on, on the things that matter. You know, when, we, when you come up with uh, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer lending model, probably it will help to also uh, find out whether the banking infrastructure across the microfinance is, is already there. And then maybe uh, when we start talking about health, you know, coming up with the you know, applications wherein you connect pharmacies to, to individuals. Maybe we have to find out a way by which we can link this to actually funding, you know, the construction of, uh, of, uh, of hospitals. When you start talking about making sure that everybody's educated, maybe we should, we should find a way by which uh, we come up with fintech or funding for fintech-enabled schools. When, when, when you don't have schools <laughs> to basically facilitate education or, or train teachers for that matter. So I think, again, it's complex, but uh, when you get down to you know, that, that anecdote that I shared, you know, how can you help a, a, a person to go cashless in the first place? He doesn't have cash, right? So. Thanks. I'm, I'm sort of imagining a teacher halfway through a lesson stopping because somehow the cashless payments haven't come through onto his or her phone. But, but yeah. And the salary, I, right? I, it's not I'm the sort of <laughs> slightly horrified. But, but I take the point completely. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm just going to, uh, I think we have a machine that can click up questions magically. So I'm going to ask the organizers if we have anything like that. Um, we do. There it is. It's not behind me. It's in front of me. Uh, what role does re what role do regulators play in standardizing measurements and targets? Okay, that had zero votes. So thank you, everybody. Um, uh, any other uh, questions have come up? Maybe from the floor. Are there any humans that want to kind of jump up and kind of uh, make a comment? We have a, a roving mic. Fintech people are very shy, I notice. Uh, it's quite unexpected. Okay. All right. Well, look, let me, let me if, if somebody changes their mind, just kind of wave their hands around. Um, and I will pick up this question as I come back for a second round. So, so Greta, I'm going to start with you, but then just leave it as a sort of open discussion. I, I think the question of um, how does one make sure that fintech plays a constructive role rather than the assumption, perhaps the wrong assumption that we've made in the financial inclusion space, that it somehow inherently or automatically delivers development outcomes. Um, what do we need to do to kind of push forward the right kind of innovation in the market? And Piersh, coming back to the point that perhaps you implied, but, but also from elsewhere, what, what is the role of regulators and policymakers to aligning the way in which fintech is disrupting and changing financial and capital markets with the kind of financing flows we need to support sustainable development. So I guess it's a sort of a mixture of a question about scale, about barriers, and about how we deal with them. Well, it's a big question. And I might actually even be able to get a little bit at the question that somebody's asking here. Um, you know, We've only been at this for a few years, right? And, and I think we're starting to build the use cases that at the retail level solve or begin to solve some of the basic development needs, giving people light after dark, giving people access to basic insurance products, giving people access to clean water, right? And I think those make important contributions, but we, we need to build kind of the virtuous circle within markets. And, and in, in Africa, where I do a lot of my work, those markets are really small, so capital markets become messy, but we, we need to build those virtuous circles because um, there's a need for local currency financing and we need to sort of make sure that capital is circulating. So to the point on on standardizing measurements and targets, actually one of the, the areas that we're really interested in is how you start using fintech and, and the ability to kind of pull in money from a very broad spectrum of people um, into investable vehicles. So, you know, there's, I spoke with somebody yesterday or the day before about micro pensions and work they're doing around micro pensions. The, the insurance industry needs to develop in these markets. Um, but also, you know, asset financing is perfect for securitization, but you've got to build up enough. Right now, there's not enough volume in it, but you need those standards. You need kind of clear um, KPIs. And if you look, particularly the off-grid energy um, industry, it's an industry that mixes together energy service companies with asset financing, and they actually don't have a great deal of clarity. So we're doing some work um, to just 
help make those business models clear, help make those balance sheets clear so that investors can come in and so you start building up enough volume so that you can start generating some of that, uh, the essential capital markets development that you need. So I think there's a really big chicken and egg problem and you've got to connect the retail with the wholesale and there's a, an important role for government to play, there's an important role for investors to play. Um, but it's complicated and it's going to take time. Okay. Um, anyone would like to follow on from that? Pia Shannon, whether you want to jump in on this, how do you move from measurement to valorization, which perhaps links back to the question that's being asked as well? Yeah, I think, uh, so let me approach it differently. So I may want to go back to this thought. I, I think some ways saying, what will digital finance do for sustainable development is like cart before horse, or it's the tail trying to wag the dog. So I think there are two big things in sustainable development, right? One is the development agenda, and the other is how do you make it sustainable for long-term benefits of the planet and, 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 and communities. I think technology changes the development agenda. So you can now create business models which are very new. You talked about e-commerce, Greta. That's a great example. You know, people who are not plugged into the global supply chain system or couldn't sell now can. So I think technology is a game changer because you can think of new development uh, opportunities. Uh, I think technology also changes the sustainable part of this thing. You can now put a solar panel on your roof and then you can supply electricity to the grid on and off, etc. I think digital finance is important because it enables that. So once you can change the business model, for the model to work, you need to have a digital financing capability, whether it's payments or you know credit or so on and so forth. That's one. But I think the other big thing around sustainability is what I refer to. I think we need to figure a conscious change at a societal level for what is value. You know, how do you create and how do you determine value, which means you've got to take all the social costs and benefits into account. Now, one, one hope is that everybody changes. So people start thinking differently, companies think differently, the sense of philanthropy and altruism. And like I said, while some of that is happening, I'm not going to hold my breath that the world is suddenly all going to you know, turn uh, holy overnight. It's not going to happen. So then you've got to figure, if it's not going to happen by itself, the only way it will happen is you've got to figure a way to take some of these externalities and put them into the accounting mechanisms and the PNL mechanisms that we know work today, the market economy. So for that to happen, while there can be some business initiatives and so on, I think the biggest impact will come from governments and regulators. That is the only way you can actually figure a standard way of measuring, a standard way of being able to track, and a standard way of translating the intangible to what is today tangible. Right? You can't arbitrarily do it. To me, carbon taxation schemes, for example, and uh, carbon trading schemes are the best way to think about it. The minute a government decides, hey, this is what I'm going to start, how I'm going to start measuring pollution. This is how I'm going to convert the cost of pollution into a real measurable price. And then digital finance comes in and says, all right, if you're willing to price pollution at 10 bucks a ton, then we can set up a digital exchange where people can trade that pollution. And once you do that, it converts the intangible cost to a tangible thing, and digital finance can enable that to happen. But you need a sufficient thing. Regulators have to play a role. Government policy has to play a role. So if government policy does not tax the carbon in the first place, it's hard for digital finance to create it uh, in a vacuum. But, but Piyush, let, let me just um, take off my normal policy hat <clears throat> and put on my slightly odder markets for everyone hat. You know, so you gave the example of Ant Financial Services and the Ant Forests app that has effectively created a non-policy driven informal carbon market for 320 million Chinese people through algorithms on financial transaction tax to carbon with a sort of benefits model that gamifies through a social media platform to create a, a modicum of addiction that keeps people in the game. No, no, no policy, maybe there should have been, but no policy at all. Now actually, that might drive replication and a policy architecture. So you're describing policy to markets, and I'm just wondering whether it goes the other direction as well, which is you know, digital finance innovations create ecosystems that then lend themselves to stabilization through policy architecture. Does that make I, sense? I, I, think, I think that's true, Simon. So remember what I said, I don't think Everybody is going to turn uh, philanthropic, altruistic, and well-meaning uh, overnight. But obviously, the large numbers of people who are. And so if you can give everybody a carbon report card and say, hey, this is your carbon footprint and carbon consumption, you give it to 300 million people, 
My bet is that you will get 3 or 4% of those people who will do something about it. That's my point. I don't think 96% of people will automatically say, hey, this is my carbon report card, which means I better change my consumption pattern or I'm going to go plant a tree. But you'll get 3 or 4%. The good thing with the 3 or 4% is that you start creating social awareness and social change. And finally, regulation and politics is a function of what the citizens and the people ask for. So once you start getting this through schemes of the sort, you start putting it on the agenda. So I'm completely with you. You need to create this to be able to push the policy envelope. It's not going to happen uh, by itself. In Singapore, for example, uh, we just last week started this uh, retail contestability of electricity, which means that uh, you can now go and choose every month, every day, uh, what electricity you want to buy. You want to buy more green electricity, you want to buy other forms of electricity. The reality is that of the people who signed up at Jurong, where we now have six months of experience, most of the people don't go for a green option. They go for the cheaper option. Right? This is just, you know, because that's the way people think right now. But some people do go for the green option. So if you can create, we've created an electricity marketplace where people can go and choose the electricity they want to buy every day. And my hope is that at the margin, as people start saying, I want the greener electricity, you start creating some momentum around that. But my point is that at a macro global level, the big things, I think you need to have right. regulation and policy that supports that shift. I'm with you. L let me open it up particularly to the other players. Jojo, you want to come in? And then Chuchurit, I'll come across to you. So barriers and scale, I think. So um, I, I think, uh, well, going back to the, the standards, I think uh, the regulator, the government has uh, definitely a, a clear, um, a clear uh, responsibility. Not only, it's not, it's not uh, enough to start talking about standardizing, but at least come up with uh, you know, something to measure uh, you know, your, your progress towards improving the lives of everybody, right? So for Cambodia, for example, uh, you know, they have a measure by which uh, are we moving from a low income to a mid-income mid -income economy? Are we, are we really uh, pulling down the, the level of poverty of, uh, um, of the country? So fintech in this regard has a very, very important role in one, consolidating uh, all of their efforts, their ideas, their creativity, and then second, uh, you know, maybe uh, those funding, you know, there's, there's plenty of uh, supply <laughs> of, of funds to, to all this. Maybe they can, they can consolidate and uh, identify which are actually impacting this, uh, you know, uh, these uh, measures across the, let's say, the uh, SDGs. Um, but the important thing is that everybody will have to ground it. Everybody will have to understand how people, people's lives are really being affected. Um, Again, you know, to, to, to give the example late, uh, earlier is that, you know, how, how many of, of, of the children are, are really capable uh, on their own or, or, or with the support of the government to actually uh, take advantage of fintech for education, for example. You know, we talk about financial literacy. Who really needs financial literacy? If it's everybody, then we have to be able to measure uh, the level of education and the level of literacy of everybody. So. So I think, I think the government, uh, the regulators will have a good hand. And I, I guess, uh, for example, in financial inclusion, uh, they have what they're calling the Maya Declaration. But as I said, you know, uh, maybe on the SDGs, everybody will have to have some declaration of support on, on, on how to effectively measure that for it to be very, very effective. Okay. So, Jarita, sort of same question. I guess I, I kind of feel... I can put my policy hat on and it's all okay because we need governments. I I'm still slightly wary because our governments don't always seem to do quite what's needed. So, so t uh, I'd love to understand from you also the, the sort of the dynamic between the barriers to really deploying fintech in an effective way and, and kind of which, a which actors need to, uh, need to step in to make that work effectively. And Simon, you have another question with some votes and in that as well. And actually, the question is exactly that question, uh, which is, to Pierce's point on pricing of sustainability values, which are the agents of change that can affect that and how? And that's sort of what I was kind of pushing a little bit at you. Yeah. So um, I, I do think that uh, one, I think the pricing of sustainability, the measurement tracking of impact, somehow needs to happen much faster. Right, that, than, uh, than it does. So, you know, in my previous organization, Howard ran a study on impact assessment that took 
take like a, nearly a decade. And the thing is that in a decade, the, everything, the world has moved on, everything is different. So somehow it seems like that whole cycle of is this, uh, is this good for the customer, is this not good, how do you measure that sustainability needs to be happening way quicker. Uh, and I think that there, there are probably ways we can do this now with uh, tech and analytics. On the question around agents for change, I, I do think that there, you know, uh, I don't think that this is going to get solved with incremental approaches of let the customer choose what is better, let the retail customer choose, you know, more green options. I just don't think it's going to happen that way. I think, you know, the large... Uh, controllers of capital in this in this world will have to take a call uh, around this matters this is going to matter for the success of our institutions when we look at not the five year horizon but the 80 year horizon or the 100 year horizon and they're going to have to drive this change so i think that you know it's the large really mega uh, you know uh, financial institutions which will have to come in and say that you know what I'm going to measure, uh, the exchange is going to measure value differently. Um, I think that the government taxation policy supporting this will, of course, help. But I don't think it's going to be the retail customers pricing it. I mean, it's just, it feels like it will happen too late. Uh, and I don't think, in, I mean, I agree with Piyush's point that enlightenment, I don't think, is going to come soon enough for when the change really needs to happen. And, and so I can see... And so, Simon, part of the problem is the barrier. See, the, one of the big issues, you know, I represent a big financial institution, so... Uh, and by the way, they're agents of change. Asset owners are agents of change. My investors are already beginning to say, what are you doing about sustainability? My customers and employees are beginning to ask the question. But there is one inherent dilemma, which is, uh, um, to your point, the, the, so... The asset owners might want to, let's say, for example, drive more environmental cleanliness, so clean uh, environment, and they decide, okay, palm oil is a, 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 a non-sustainable crop, so let's do less of that. Now, what happens? There are 14 million people who rely on palm oil for livelihood and living in Indonesia and Malaysia. So we decide collectively, the financial system, let's not do palm oil anymore. So what happens to these 14 million people? If the government is not involved in rehabilitating them, finding an alternative, these people, livelihood suffers, education suffers. Now, you're, you're playing God. You're making a choice between the livelihood and income of the 40 million people versus the notion that maybe this is a polluting crop. And these 40 million people elected a government. And the elected government of the country said, hey, we're okay with this. So then you also start figuring, so who am I to play God? Am I the person who should be making the determination about what is the right outcome for society because I own capital? How is that very different from colonial imperialism? So I'm sitting outside and say, hey, you don't know what's good for your people in your country. I will tell you what's good for you and your people. So these are really challenging questions. They're questions of texture and nuance. What is the right thing to do? Who should determine the right thing to do? And how do you get individuals, stakeholders, as all to a common uh, end solution? This is obviously a you know, complex problem. It is. Thank you. Uh, and, and obviously the governance side of this is a critical piece. So that, that's going to bring me in a way onto my last question. And we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, so I'm just going to ask people to canter slightly through uh, their answers. So um, at the UN General Assembly in September in New York, the UN Secretary General uh, announced that he would champion uh, a task force on this topic. So on the question of where the fintech side or the digitalization of the financial system either can be harnessed or needs to be shaped or is going to influence uh, the way in which financing uh, flows towards sustainable or unsustainable outcomes. Uh, that task force will be launched in the next few weeks um, and will flow across most of 2019 into 20. If you were you know, speaking to the Secretary General right now, he's sort of sitting there over in the corner somewhere saying, the thing you really have to think about is X. This is the really key thing to think about. What would you be pushing him to take into account? 
Maybe, Greta, I'll start with you again, if I may. I think in reflecting on this conversation, sustainability is a really big word, and it encompasses a lot of different things. So in some ways, it's about the environment. In some ways, it's about access, right? And so I think we need to kind of work on building um, virtuous circles that not only support sort of the signals that you're talking about, but, you know, in some markets, people don't have a choice about clean electricity. They have a choice about electricity. And so there's a whole bunch of work that needs to be done to get those things in the hands of people. And I think digital finance can really help with that. It's about connecting the dots to the bigger agenda. Okay, short answers given the clock is beckoning us. Please. Um, I, I think I think it's, uh, a lot, it's, it's again, it's complex, but I think the, the, the thing that I'll tell the Secretary General is that uh, is there a way by which uh, you know, we have a measure on the impact uh, that is understandable by everybody? Right? Again, it's a complex thing. How do you measure that people are really zero poverty? It's really everybody not poor anymore. But uh, uh, I think it, it, it goes along the way of uh, being, uh, you know, being, being able to standardize, not standardize, but come up with really clear measures that will be the basis for success. Fantastic. Thank you. Piyush? Well, I'd focus on three things. The first I talked about, see how digital finance can help bring transparency to the cost and value of externalities. Second, see how digital finance can continue to promote inclusion. The heated debate we had before is the outcomes of inclusion are uncertain, but just seems to me that making sure people are in the formal system for credit and for banking is probably a good thing. And third, continue to use digital finance to reduce friction in the system. So if you can improve efficiency and reduce cost, that has to create some overall developmental value. Thank you. So Charita? Um, well, to the UN Secretary General, I would have one request, uh, which is how to drive more capital into businesses that are driving sustainability. I don't think that there are enough long-term sources of capital at all, uh, that, uh, and which is why there aren't enough companies that are doing that, and even development financial institutions that are sponsored uh, by uh, multiple governments uh, really need to be a lot less risk averse uh, about uh, their investing strategy. I, I do think that you know, there needs to be a reform of uh, that agenda to say, take that risk. Your capital was meant to take that risk to drive these development outcomes, and you're not doing it right now. Thank you. So, so just to close, Jojo, you said uh, in your opening comments, um, I thought financial inclusion was complicated. You know, this is a kind of a nightmare. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and, and in a sense, you're right. Um, I think, as you said before we came on or in another context, you know, no one wants to buy insurance for the sake of it. It's really kind of what happens after that that gets to be interesting. Um, what I'm hoping is, is that um, the audience has heard what I've heard, you know, which is both the importance of building on the work of financial inclusion, extending it more broadly into this financing agenda, um, understanding both, if you like, the subservient nature of digital finance, I think a point that's come through, as well as the fact that it can catalyze change. A and I would hope, perhaps, with my final comments to the organizers here, um, in both thanking them for setting up this session, that perhaps next year, alongside financial inclusion, we can spend more time figuring out what sorts of market innovations, perhaps in partnership with policymakers and regulators, have begun to sort of build this nexus more effectively between fintech uh, and broader sustainable development outcomes through financing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would join me, please, in thanking the panel very much and also yourselves for being here.